We hear many times when we talk about the faith, about how our faith is countercultural, how society wants one thing, but the church, or God, through the church, asks of something completely different in our lives. We see this front, front and center really in our gospel this weekend, when we see this tax collector compared to this Pharisee. Now, the Pharisee is much like many people in our society. They want to be lifted up. They want to be put on this pedestal, and they want to be proud in a negative sense of all of the good that they have done. Just look at me. I'm the most important person in the world. I'm just so special. I do everything I'm supposed to do. Don't you just love me? That's really the braggadociousness that we see in this Pharisee today. And many times we fall into that same trap ourselves in life where we want to be lifted up. We want to be lauded for all of the greatness that we have done. Of course, forgetting where our gifts, our talents, our skills, and our abilities come from, the Lord. And then we have this tax collector, this man who comes into the temple. I, I've always pictured this as like the, the Pharisee sitting here so everybody could see him just there in his piety, and this tax collector barely making his way in the door, sitting in that back pew, just hiding his face and saying, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's interesting that Christ, time and time again, uses countercultural people in his society to teach the lesson to the people that are supposed to know right from wrong. How many times does Christ use tax collectors to teach a lesson? They are looked down on in society, yet our patron, St. Matthew was what? A tax collector, became one of the great apostles. And then we continue to look at the people that Christ used to teach messages and lessons through. He used women. Women in the society of Christ were looked down on in the sense of they weren't to be trusted. They had no authority. So much so that even when we read the gospel of the resurrection... Not one, but two women had to share what had happened at this, the tomb for anybody to believe it. Because if one woman says something, she's just making it up. If two, eh, it could be plausible. But Christ time and time again, and God time and time again, uses women who again were looked down on in that society to teach a lesson. We see this with the woman at the well. We see this with the person of Mary, that he teaches us these great lessons, and then he goes a step further, and he uses the enemies of the Jewish people, the Samaritans, time and time and time again. He uses these countercultural figures to show us that we aren't quite doing what we need to do. But many times, we... 2,000 years later, fall into the same trap as the Pharisees, fall into the same trap as the apostles who think that they knew better. I used to love, and I still love, our second reading today from St. Paul, but when we have that reading today from St. Paul right in front of this gospel, it sheds a different light, I think, on the figure of St. Paul. I have finished the race. I have fought the fight. I have competed well. Look at me. That's how we kind of see it in the light of today's gospel. Now, that's not what he meant it to be. But there is a good pride that we are called to have in our lives. And that's what St. Paul was trying to show us. Though many times we could be distracted by his over-pious zealousness where he wants to be showy, someone saying, man, I was this horrible sinner. I had this great conversion experience. I want to witness. I want to let you know about God's love. And sometimes that can come across in a braggy way. Have you ever met someone in the faith that is just too pious to be around sometimes? Where they feel like they're preachy just being in your presence? I had something like that in my life growing up, and it was one of those where I was almost off-put because I could never live up to this person. 
But at the same time, that's what we're called to strive for, isn't it? We're called to strive for perfection. We're called to strive to be a saint, not just after we die, but be saints in training here on earth. But many times we fall short of that. And so when people are living out the faith, we begin to get upset with them. How dare you? Who do you think you are that you can judge me because of my imperfections? I remember who you are. Remember that old saying that Christ says, a prophet is never welcome at home? I would love at some point in my priesthood to be the pastor at my home parish. But at the same time, I would hate it. Because they knew me as little Danny. To this day when I go back, rarely am I called Father Danny because I was in third grade and sixth grade and seventh grade and eighth grade in those troubling times when I got into all sorts of fun trouble. Not fun trouble. It was fun back then. Nowadays, look back and say, ah, what were you doing? But they still look at me as that child. Just like many of you who grew up in this parish or who grew up in your family, it's hard to break free of that mold that we were looked at as children. In fact, when I go home, one of my dad's biggest complaints was that, Danny, when you are at work, you are on fire, you give everything. When you come home, you suck. You do nothing. And it wasn't until my dad had actually talked to the Um, keeper of Camp Olog, our Catholic summer camp, whose brother is a bishop, he said, oh no, he's the same way when he comes home too. It's like you're supposed to sit there, relax, do nothing. It's like, well, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do when you go home, relax and do nothing, right? Parents, that's what you do when you go home, right? No. But we get to do that every once in a while. So we go home, we want to put our feet up, watch some sports, do all of these things and allow things to be done around us. We fall into that trap sometimes of not being humble, of not recognizing from whom our gifts and talents came from. We fall into that trap of the Pharisee in today's gospel. But how many times do we fall into that trap in our lives without even recognizing it? Growing up, I had never witnessed until I was almost 30 years old at Mass someone not going to communion. I'd never really witnessed that. Because I grew up in the United States for the most part, and if you don't go to receive communion, you come up and put your hands across your chest, right? It's not like that everywhere in the world. Did you know that? In fact, the first time that I witnessed this was the first time that I went to Mexico to attempt to learn Spanish. I purposely used the word attempt because my Spanish is pretty rocky, but I'm trying. And I went to Mexico and went to Mass, and... We as Americans are very German in how we do things. We don't realize that. We want right, we want order, we want discipline. So much so that many of our churches, when you come up for communion, have ushers at the end of the pew to release you from your pew. And we go one pew, two pew, three pew, four pew. In Mexico, uh uh-uh. Everybody comes up at the same time. And it's not orderly fashion lines. It's like the children's collection, but half of the church. And so it's like, where do I start? Pick someone, Father. The body of Christ, 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 body of Christ. And you just got a mob, and it's beautiful. But what's even more beautiful is when you look out at the pews, they aren't empty. In fact, 40 to 50 percent of the pews are still full. Now, part of that is us gringos that don't understand the rules, that you just go up there whenever. But the majority of it is not everybody receives communion every time they go to Mass. And I'm like, well, why are you going to Mass? I mean, what's going on here? But many people in our Latin American countries understand the dignity of the Eucharist. We don't come to Mass to take communion. We come to Mass to receive the Eucharist. And though it may be a small difference in take and receive, and we use them interchangeably many times, the difference, though it may be subtle, is important. We can't take anything that isn't given to us. If we do, we are stealing. We aren't here to steal the Eucharist. 
We're here to be given the gift of the Eucharist by the priest, the deacon, or the extraordinary minister of Holy Communion. But what's interesting, when I reflected on that, I, I started to ask myself, it's like, why aren't they going to communion? I mean, I, I started having those questions of, what's going on? Like, are, this, are there that many sinners in church? And then I realized, well, yeah, we're all sinners in church. Okay, well. Well, why would they not go to communion? I mean, everybody goes to communion, right? Well, but should everybody go to communion every Sunday? I started to think. And so the first Mass that I went to when I came back, it's like, I'm going to try a little social experiment here. Lord, please forgive me, but I'm going to try this experiment. And I did not get up to go to communion. I got the stink eye. Everybody kind of looked at me and was like, what are you doing? Get up. Get out of the way. Because there was my family. And they're like, I said, I'll scoot back. I'll get out of the way. You guys can come through. It's like, why aren't you going to communion? Like, the negative thoughts started coming. They're like, what did you do? What did you do that you can't go to communion? I didn't go to confession. It's been a while at that point. I said, you know what? I've been to confession a while, and I need to go to confession before I go to receive communion. In fact, how often does the church ask us to go to confession? Well, minimally once a year. How often can you go to confession? As often as you need to. In fact, I just hit the longest dry spell in the last five years leading up to this past Friday. Three weeks. I talk about it a lot because I know in my own life, if I don't receive the grace and peace and forgiveness of the Lord, I'm worthless. (laughs) I can't do anything good without God's grace. And so I know for myself, if I need that, how can I continue to give that gift to everyone else by offering it as often as possible? We have it offered here typically twice a week, Friday between 11 and noon during adoration and Saturdays between 3.30 and 4.30 or any time you want to go. Send me an email, shoot me a text, give me a phone call. I will come to you if you'd like for the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Now this next week I'm on retreat, don't call. But outside of those times, If you need or want to go, don't hesitate. Oh, but Father, you're so busy. Uh Uh-huh, so are you. But nothing is going to make me too busy except for when I'm on retreat in Dallas. From hearing and forgiving your sins for God. But many times we fall into that temptation of the Pharisee in today's gospel. And we tell ourselves, well, I haven't done anything too bad. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't committed perjury, of which I say, good. But there are so many other sins that we commit that we don't even realize it. And so we have a false righteousness, much like the Pharisee in today's gospel. When we come forward to receive the Eucharist, are we truly worthy in that moment to receive the Eucharist? What is the last thing that we say as a community of faith, before we come up for communion. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Why do we say that? Well, some of us, because we are machines and we just kind of go through the motions. But many of us as well We take to heart those words, Lord, I'm not worthy. Nothing I can do can make me worthy to receive your Eucharist. Please have mercy on me, God. As the tax collector prayed in today's gospel. But many times when we come forward to receive the Eucharist, we're doing it just because everyone around us expects us to. Don't do that. Because the Lord wants your very heart. The Lord will never turn his back on you. It's us who turns our back on the Lord through our sin and our unrepentance and our unreconciliation with he who is the author of love. So if it's been a while since you've been to confession, consider, first of all, going to confession, making a good confession. Oh, but Father, you would be so shocked if you heard about my life and my sins, I'm friends with you on Facebook, nothing shocks me. 
and I've heard it before, and I still love you. I may try and encourage you to turn from your sinful ways because I want to be encouraged to turn from my own sinful ways. But I'll never look down on you for having the courage to speak aloud those things that we don't even want to recognize in the dark night of our soul, in the silence of our hearts. We don't even want to recognize many times that we are sinners. We want to instead turn our back on sin, which is what we should do. We want to turn our back on sin so as it's not really there, instead of admitting what it is that we've done, how we've fallen to those temptations. But also there's other reasons why we may not be worthy to receive the Eucharist. Did we fast before Mass? In fact, growing up, my dad was more stringent than the church, if that's believable. His rule, which I always thought was the rule until I joined seminary, was you have to fast an hour before Mass. That's not the rule. What is the rule for fasting for receiving the Eucharist? An hour before Communion. That's why I preach so long. That's not, but I mean, it's a good excuse. In fact, we have a whole word that we use every day that comes from that idea of fasting. Do you know what it's called? What's the first meal of the day? It should be breakfast at least. Most of us, it's like brunch at noon. That's lunch. Breakfast. Where does the word coming from? To break the fast. <laughs> that before Vatican II, there were no vigil masses. Saturday night mass wouldn't have existed because it wouldn't have counted. Logistics, whatever. But now, we break the fast. We should break the fast with what? The Eucharist. Because we're trying to keep our bodies in that penitential nature that the Lord can come in and heal our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our very being, and replace it with everything that we need. All we need is Him, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And so, have we fasted before Mass? Have we even asked ourselves that question? Do we chew gum on the way into Mass or during Mass? Don't do it, because that could be breaking the fast. Outside of medicine, and for diabetics that means sometimes a sugary beverage, we shouldn't eat or drink anything for an hour before receiving communion. But there's other reasons why we may not be worthy to receive the Eucharist. Sin, we missed Mass, haven't been to confession, didn't fast. Or we may have anger in our hearts. What does the Lord tell us about anger in our hearts? If you have anger in in your heart, go and resolve your differences and then come back and make your offering. I think we all fall into that trap at different times in our lives. We may not have made that reconciliation with our brothers and sisters who have just pushed our button for the last time. How do we start that? Well, Same when we start everything else, or should start everything else, by inviting the Lord into it and praying for them. Oh, but Father, I don't want to pray for them. God doesn't care if you want to pray for them or not. We still should. But Father, I don't have the words to pray for them. Jesus gave them to you. That perfect prayer where we even condemn ourselves more often than not when we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We are telling the Lord to only have the amount of mercy on us that we are willing to give to others. God forbid he give us that answer of a prayer. I pray that he is more merciful with us than we are ever with each other. In the gospel this weekend, we are given an opportunity to recognize that none of us are truly righteous. None of us will ever be truly worthy outside of the sacrifice of Christ. To call ourselves sons and daughters of God, let alone call ourselves followers of Christ, Christian, or Catholic. 
Praise be to God that he has mercy on us when we call upon him. May the words of the tax collector in today's gospel be words for us to give us encouragement. When we approach the altar today to receive the Eucharist or to receive a blessing, may we repeat them in our hearts. O God, be merciful to me, a sinner.